We're starting a brand new series today, and it's been in my heart for a long time, and we're going to be in the book of Daniel, starting a series called Surviving the Circus, Surviving the Circus, and uh, we're going to learn how to stand firm and love well in a, in a place of compromise, and, and so it's really just a deep dive in the book of Daniel, which is an Old Testament prophet. We'll get into all that. You'll find it if you're on your digital Bible. You can just search Daniel. Uh, if you have a Bible at home, bring it. Uh, when you go home, you can start reading through Daniel with us, but we're going to start in Daniel 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to find out what's going on right here. We're going to jump right into it, and I'll try to explain my best. It says this, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Notice the little G God, right? You know, when the little G God's written, it's a diss towards all the, it's a diss to the real God, or the diss to the fake gods. And so I'm going to unpack this in a moment, but before we can even intro you to Daniel and, and, and some characters in the Bible that we're going to learn from the next few weeks, we have to understand the context and what's going on in this moment. So this actually book was written in 605 BC. That means it was before Jesus was here on earth. But it was after the nation of Israel, who was God's chosen people, split into two kingdoms, and in one kingdom was Judah. And so through Judah, King David comes, the one who slayed Goliath, the one who became king over Israel. He has now died, and his son Solomon actually built the eighth wonder of the world called the Temple of God. Solomon's no longer in the picture, but in Jerusalem, where Judah is at, Solomon built the Temple of God where the presence of God would be at, and that's where they would go to worship and pray before Jesus came. Now that Jesus has come, we are the Temple of God. The Spirit lives in us, and the Temple is on wheels. It goes wherever we go. It's incredible because that means you can take the temple of God to your workplace. You can take it to your school. People who are like, they need the presence of God. They got you next to them. They should be experiencing it every moment of the day because we have the presence of God. So I haven't preached in a few weeks, so I got to stay focused. All right, so with that being said, what happened this moment? So Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the most wicked and largest city at this time, named Babylon. And so they actually show up to Jerusalem, and they ransack it. They vandalize it. They destroy the temple. They destroy Jerusalem. They take sacred items from the temple of God. They bring them back, and they put them in the temple to their gods. And with them, they take captive the men, women, and the people of Judah, put them in chains and shackles, and send them through the desert back to Babylon. And now they are living in Babylon as captives. The people of God have been taken captive, and now they're in Babylon in a dark and bad situation. So that's kind of the idea happening here. And I'm telling you, they were in a culture shock, a lot like how I am when I go visit my in-laws in North Carolina. They sound like auctioneers when they talk, y'all. I don't know what they're saying. Anyway, so I can say that here, not there. Anyway, so, but while we're there, they were in culture shock. And here's why. Because when you look at Babylon, you look at Judah, who is the nation of God, the kingdom of God in their customs. Babylon is a direct opposite of the kingdom of God. It is literally countercultural to the kingdom of God, the nation of God. Now, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, we know that because we're in Christ, we are now part of the nation of God. We are the people of God, the church of God. So we have culture and kingdom and customs that Jesus has taught us. And Babylon is completely countercultural to that. So, for instance, if the kingdom of God is about obedience to God's word, Babylon is about disobedience to God's word. If the kingdom of God is about holiness, Babylon is about wickedness and evil. If the kingdom of God is about celebrating God and the truth that sets us free, Babylon is all about worshiping multiple gods, even including sexuality, money, and greed, and let's say this, even self. And If Jerusalem was one nation under God, Babylon would be a place that curses God. And I don't say that as a political statement. I'm just letting you know what they're in now. It's a complete 180 to where they were at, and now they're living in this dark situation that is completely countercultural to how we should live. How do we live in a dark place and still hold to the customs and culture of the kingdom of God? Listen, we are in 2023 now, and Babylon has disappeared It is gone. It no longer exists, but the Spirit still does. How many people know that even though we are in America today, we can honestly say that the Spirit of Babylon is still alive in 2023 in America? 
and in other nations. And I don't say that to discourage you. We are not doing this series to teach you how to build a doomsday like bunker and to get all the food and hide away from the culture in your life. That is not why we're doing this. Actually, the whole reason why I wanted to talk about Daniel is because I think it's going to produce hope for us in the midst of what our culture is going through. I think it's going to help us, and we're going to find out why in a moment and what this looks like. You might say, Sean, how in the world could this bring hope when Judah has been literally taken captive? They have been ripped from their hometown. They're in a dark situation. The temple has been ransacked where they worship God. They can no longer go to that place, and he takes sacred objects and puts them into his own temple of his gods. How can you say that? Because maybe, just maybe, the reason we can have hope is because maybe this is a part of God's plan. I know that might shake some feathers a little bit, but let me remind you of what verse 2 said. Maybe you missed it. Verse 2, we already read it, said this. The Lord gave him, who's him? Nebuchadnezzar. Victory over King Joachim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. Wait, are you telling me that God allowed this to happen? It said God permitted it. He allowed it. Now, I don't have time to unpack this, but let me just say it this way that the people of God had their hearts turned away from God, and he warned them time and time and time. Again, I know we never deal with this. I know God never has to warn us, but time and time and time again, God said, please turn your heart back to me, and they wouldn't do it. And sometimes God is so good that he'll allow pain into our life so he can turn his heart back to us or back to him. And that's exactly what's happening in this moment. So why is this not, why is this, why is this hopeful, Sean? Because check this out. If God allowed it, that means he's still in control of it. If God allowed a dark situation, he didn't create it. But if he allowed it, he's still in control over it. He's still a part of it. Actually, a hundred years before Babylon took over Jerusalem, there's this guy named Micah. It's a little book in the Old Testament. He's a prophet that spoke to the people of God, and he warned Israel of this. He warned Jerusalem of this. Micah 410 and 704 to 696 BC said these words I want you to unpack today. Writhe and, writhe and groan like a woman in labor, you people of Jerusalem. So that's who he's talking to. For now you must leave this city to live in the open country. You will soon be sent in exile to distant Babylon. But, everyone say but. I love the buts in the Bible. You didn't laugh at that. Okay. The 11 o'clock would love that. You're all the saved ones. I forgot. You're the saints. All right. So you guys don't joke. You guys do nothing. You guys have it together. All right. So here it is. But the Lord will rescue you where? There. You might be in Babylon, but God is still in control. He will redeem you from the grip of your enemies. I don't know how bad our situation looks, but I want to remind you, if God allowed it, he's still in control over it, and he can rescue no matter how dark your situation is. And we have to understand that. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, they may be captive to Babylon, You may be under Babylon's control, but Babylon is under God's control. And I know we may live in a nation now that looks like it's rejecting truth every single day. But I want to remind you, we may be under that control, but the U.S. is still under God's control. The nations of this world are still under God's control. He's a big God. And this is why we don't have to walk around like victims in this culture. We can walk around thriving in this culture. This is why we're doing this series. Because even in dark Babylon, which was way worse than America's even going through, I don't got time to unpack stuff they did, but that spirit's still there. God had a plan. And so he raised up four Hebrew boys that came from Judah because the king asked his people to get people from Hebrew country and train them in the ways of Babylon, the literature, the customs, and the language. And so he picks these four boys. And so God's plan and he's still in control. He raises up these men. This is so amazing. These boys who were teenagers, I'm talking to teenagers right now, just in case you think there's a junior Holy Spirit, God used teenagers to turn the hearts of the Babylonians back to him. He's raising up teenagers, because we're going to find out in a second, and these ones literally gave hope to the nation of Israel, and not just that, because of who they were and following God, even Babylonian kings would turn their hearts to the one true God. And if God can do that in Babylon, he can do that in 2023. So let me introduce you guys to the characters today. This is Daniel and his buddies. Daniel 1, starting in verse 6. It says, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. Because these ones, the chief of staff, renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. 
Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. We're going to sit right there for a second and find out what's going on in this moment. So you've been introduced to these four boys who got their names changed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And in this moment, we find out that not only were they picked to be trained up in the palace, in the temple, even in a dark place, they should have not even been able to be picked as Hebrews, but God's already opening the door to get them into the places he needs to be. We got to be careful that we don't ridicule people who are in platforms and places of dark situations, because God might be rising up Christian leaders in places that don't look good. Oh, oh, you shouldn't be there. That's what I would have thought with Daniel in the palace. Why are you spending time with Nebuchadnezzar? Because God's about ready to do something great in the temple. And if he can get Nebuchadnezzar's heart, he can change a nation. So in this moment, they are in this place and he brings them in. And we have to look at this for a moment because it said while they're in training, they had a little bit of perks. It said they had access to all the drink the special items and food at the king's table. They were able to eat like kings. Which gets me thinking about a lost commodity in 2023. A national treasure that is disappearing quickly. It's the buffet. Who knows about the buffet? You know, it's like, I was raised at the buffet, y'all. After Sunday, Buster's in Pontiac, Illinois, everybody. You start with the salad. They don't have big enough plates, so you have to do like do double plates, you know what I'm saying? They got different size plates. Uh, when we were in Israel, a bunch of us, every night for dinner, there was buffets everywhere. And I'm a foodie, and I'm in a different country. You better believe I'm going to try every single thing that is on that place, as long as it wasn't still squirming and it looked on. Anyway, so, but the truth is, is this buffet was so big, this buffet had other buffets. You know what I'm talking about? There was a salad buffet, there was a soup buffet, and everybody, come on, there was a dessert buffet. You know what I'm saying? We can stop right there. And at this dessert buffet, I just remember trying all these things. I'm eating everything. And while I'm consuming this and eating this, I look over, and the guy who's on the trip who I became really close friends with, I noticed that he wasn't really eating the dessert. And so I prodded him a little bit. And I was like, what's going on? And I realized after talking to him is the reason why he wasn't eating it. Uh, Even though he would eat a square here and there, it was because he just got done losing a lot of weight. And he's been very focused on making sure he keeps that weight off. And so he went with the plan. And I was like, oh, that's really great. So I went up and ate his portions too. (laughs) I'm on vacation. And uh, paying for that now, right? Like working that back off. And so so I found out that even though he would do that, he wouldn't consume it. But I went up and consumed what was on that. And and I just wonder in 2023 if your approach to culture is a lot like my approach to that buffet. Like just because it's on the buffet, you have to eat it. And I'm just going to let you know that in 2023, there's a smorgasbord. That's what they used to call it, the buffet. There is a smorgasbord of options in our culture that we can eat from. There's addictions that we consume every single day. There is pornographic images that weigh heavy on our soul. There are lyrics that objectify God's creation that we consume and eat and eat and eat. And just because it's on the buffet doesn't mean we have to consume it. And I wonder if we, in 2023, as the people of God, forget that just because something is on the buffet and it's in culture doesn't mean the people of God should be consuming it. And I want to talk a little bit about this because it's important because what happens is we consume addictions, we consume the gambling and the greed, and we consume all these things. And what we don't know is we consume the weight of the world and our spiritual health wreaks havoc because of it. We have the weight of the world and our spiritual state is suffering. And so how did Daniel... And a culture of consumption handled this. He had conviction. Daniel had conviction. It says, in a culture obsessed with consumption, we need to be people with conviction. How do we thrive and how do we survive in this circus? How do we survive in 2023 as the people of God when everyone's consuming whatever they want to consume? We have to be people with conviction. We have to be people like Daniel. You're like, Sean, I don't even know what conviction is. Well, let me help you. Conviction is a strong persuasion or belief. And as people of God, we got some strong beliefs when it comes to the customs of God, when it comes to the lifestyle of God. But my favorite definition of conviction is this. Can you go back real quick? That my favorite is this, the state of being convinced. Are we convinced that the buffet at God's table 
is better than the buffet at culture's table? Are we convinced that what God gives us is more than enough that we don't have to eat anything else in this world? Now, I'm just telling you, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I consume things in this world that I shouldn't be consuming. Sometimes there's things in my life that I fail in, but I got to remind myself, am I convinced that I can say no to things because I know God can satisfy everything in me? Am I fully convinced that God can give me everything I need? See, Daniel knew that even though this looked like a blessing, there was food everywhere, there was drink everywhere, there was so much at this table, he said, nah, I'm going to politely, it says, refrain from this table. Why would he refrain from this table? Let, let, me, let me unpack this real quick. He refrained from this table, and if we want to have a conviction like Daniel, we've got to do the same. He knew who he was. He knew who God created him to be. Write this down if you're taking notes. Personal identification will always lead to powerful conviction. When we know who we are, leave that up for them for a little bit. When we know who we are, when we are convinced who God created us to be, we can stand firm when everyone else is consuming everything. In a world obsessed with consumption, we can be people of conviction. Why? Because Daniel knew who he was. Let me unpack this for you. Daniel and his friends were Hebrews. And they worship the one true God, the God we worship, the one who sent Jesus for our sins. They worship the one God. There is no other God. There is no other gods. It's just one God. All the other gods are false. And the, even though Babylon's worshiping their, these gods, he knew, I worship one God. The issue is, is because he worships one God, he finds out that all the food and all the drink at the king's table before it was placed there was offered to idols and their gods. So because he knew who he was, he did not consume the food at the table because he knew it would defile him because he didn't want to eat food that was worshipped to other gods. Now, this is an Old Testament belief. We don't have time to unpack in New Testament how God has freed us from legalism. He has freed us from all that, and we have our own convictions through Christ. I don't got time to unpack that. The moral of the story is this, is that when we know who we are, the people of God, the heart of God, and we know, just like he was a Hebrew, we can withstand from things at the king's table, even though they look appetizing. See, Daniel knew who he was, and because he knew who he was, he had conviction to say no to things at the table. And you have to realize at this point, let's unpack what's going on, because this is where they crossed the line. At this moment, they were picked. They've been taught the culture of Babylon the customs of Babylon, they're learning the literature of Babylon, the language of Babylon, they're being like brainwashed into the idea of Babylon, and there was no issues there. They learned about it. It's okay to be in it, but the moment they ate that table, they would be of the culture. And y'all, we may be in the culture, but we can't be of the culture. And there's that fine line. You see, they changed their names right away. I'm going to tell you real quick. This is what the spirit of Babylon will do when, for the people of God. It will try to rename you. Did you notice? They took them in, and the first thing they did is says, we're going to take their Hebrew names, and we're going to change them to Babylonian names. Because their Hebrew names will glorify God. All their names had something to do to glorify God. And they said, we can't have that. we got to change their name. And if we're not careful, culture will change our character. But Daniel knew something. Daniel said, they may change the character of my name, but they will not change the character of my heart. A question for you is, even though you're in this culture, is your friend circle maybe changing the character of your name, but with it changing the character of your heart? Because integrity is being the same place wherever we are. And Daniel said, no, nah, you can change my name, but you can't change the heart. And we got to be people who realize that culture may say something to us. They may try to force feed us other things, but we got to know who we are in Christ and what God's word says. There's no more important time in 2023 to know who you are in Christ and what to consume and what not to consume. Why? Because identification will lead to powerful conviction. But don't forget, if identification will lead to powerful conviction, conviction will lead to test. So I wish I could tell you, like, I'm going to have conviction. I'm going to be like Daniel. I'm going to put my foot in the ground. I'm not going to consume the things the world consumes. I'm going to tell you just right now that if we choose to live with conviction, we will be tested in this culture. How do I know? Because I get tested from church people first. <laughs> you think the church would have your back first? No, no. Because sometimes 
Even in denominations now, they're consuming things of this culture. And we got to be careful that we know who we are and what's going on. But besides that, you got to understand that when we have conviction, we will go through tests. Young people, you will be tested in your schools. Young people, you will be tested online. Adults, you will be tested at your workplace. In 2023 and moving on, it's just going to be more testing. And that shouldn't scare you. You just should know who you are in Christ. And we'll talk about why this is important first. But you've got to understand that this is exactly what happened. Let me show you what happened the moment that Daniel put his foot in the ground. The assistant to the chief of staff said, uh, you can't do that. He goes, give us this vegetables and give us just water and we'll be fine. He goes, bro, we can't do that because if you look weaker than the other guys, Nebuchadnezzar is going to have my head. So I need you to eat this food. And so this is what Daniel's plan was in 11. He says, Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Look at this. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggested and tested them for 10 days. Y'all, I'm going to say something really strong right now. It might hit real hard, but I love you, okay? I've missed you. I know it's like, Sean, you should come back and just tell us you love us. I love you. And this is how much I love you. Okay, here it is. If we have not, if our character and our faith has not been tested in a while, we might not be holding on to conviction. (laughs) If our faith and our character and our identity has not been tested, In a while, we might not be living with conviction. Because I tell you what, I've been called old man Jensen from the moment I started following Jesus. Because I decided to walk away from some things at late at night and said I need to go get before my father. Not because I'm better than anybody, but because I knew I needed something more than what I currently had. Why why do I say this? Because some of you are not being tested. Actually, some of us are just being tested because we had no conviction. And we're blaming the devil for it. (laughs) Yeah, I'm back! (laughs) The devil's after me. No, 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 no. You had no conviction. We had no conviction. And now you're wreaking the bondage. Now, here's the good thing about Jesus. He died for it. He loves you. You can get back up. But I don't want you in that same place. So, If your character and faith has not been tested in a while, you might not have conviction. However that fits, just wear it, figure it out. God can work through it. But in Daniel's case, he said, test me. Now, I want to show you real quick what Daniel did not do. Daniel did not go, you heathens, you cannot make me eat this food. I'm starting a strike. I'm canceling you. We're boycotting everything. You suck. Sorry for your young people. You stink. <laughs> Do, you, use the language your parents use, not Pastor Sean. Like, Sean, he's a pastor. He, they say worse things than you. Like, all right, anyway, so what am I trying to say? He was not ranting and raving. He wasn't throwing a, a pity party because he knew something. Just because we have convictions doesn't mean the world has convictions. Why are we shocked when the world acts like the world? They're going to act like that. Quit getting so bent out of shape over how they act. You just act with conviction and let the conviction draw them into the presence of God. Don't be bent out of shape. So what does he do? He goes, uh, it says he politely asked. <laughs> it was all in the approach. I love when people call me political. Sean, you're just political. Me, not like uh, not right and left. I mean like political and like you're just trying to find the right answer. You better believe I am. Because Paul says we should have wisdom concerning how we treat outsiders so I am going to be gentle. Daniel said politely. He was like, you guys took us captive, and now you're making us eat this good food. And blah, blah, blah. It's all for the eye. What? What is it going to help? So we can have convictions, but can we stop telling the world the convictions they need to have? They don't live by the Christ standard. You're trying to hold them to the standard they don't even profess. If we spent more time holding the standard that we profess instead of telling everybody else how they need to profess their standard, I think we would get somewhere. All my unchurch people, if you're here and you're joining us, church people are notorious for hiding their failures by pointing out the world's failures. 
And we got to do better at saying, no, 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 I'm going to own my failures because God's grace works in my failures. And God can use your failures too. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that he didn't throw a fit, but what did he do? He was the one that brought the testing. He said, hey, bro, test us. Give us the carrots. Give us the broccoli. Give us the cauliflower. We don't want the Uber Eats. We don't want the Twinkies. We don't want the wine. We don't want any of that. No more DoorDash. To your gods, we want, we want veggies and we want water. Now, if I'm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'll be like, hey, Daniel, can we talk for a second? <laughs> Listen, bro, like, I mean, really, like, is it really going to matter? Like, it, it doesn't, like, we have one God. Like, does it really matter? But how many times in the Christian circles have we begin to ease ourselves into things that really doesn't matter? I can watch that. I can consume that. I can listen to that. I can keep doing that. And you think it's not going to affect your spirit? <laughs> I've been there, guys. And why am I saying this? Because if I was Sheriff Meshach and the Bendigo, I'd be like, I kind of want the ribs. I don't know if I'm for this. But Daniel's like, give us 10 days and test us. And here's what Daniel knew about testing. And if you go through testing, let me encourage you. The Bible's a lot about suffering and testing. Here's why. If we're going through testing, can we understand one thing? It's not an obstacle to your faith. It's an opportunity for your faith to be exposed to others. Testing is proof that your conviction is real. It's easy to say you have conviction until you're tested. The disciple of Jesus, Peter, who went through lots of trials and testings, he wrote a book at the end of his life, and he wrote to a bunch of Jewish believers going through hardship because of their customs, because they put their foot in the ground and said, no, we don't give in to the world's ways. Peter, who went through trials himself, who literally got hung upside down on a cross at his dying breath because they were going to hang him on a cross, but he said, I cannot die the same way as my Savior. Hang me upside down. This guy says this about testing to us. He says, these trials <laughs> show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire, test and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. He says these testings will prove that your faith is genuine. What did Peter know then that we can know here in 2023? Peter knew that just like there are knockoffs on online stores everywhere, Timu, everybody, right? Like, just because there's knockoffs online, he goes, there's knockoffs in the church too. And the only way to find out if we have a knockoff faith, and I've had it before, is when there's pressure applied. How can you tell the difference of a knockoff product and a real product? Add the pressure test. Fake Jordans will be destroyed way quicker than real Jordans. Fake gold will be tainted way quicker than real gold. When you add pressure, does it break apart? That's how you tell what a knockoff is. And so Peter says, when the testing comes, you'll find out real quick if, if your convictions are true or not. Now listen, I know we're all here. I'm so glad you made the church. I'm proud of you. You pushed through the culture. You said, I'm going to make it. You know, I'm looking around and I'm just telling you, guys, just in 2023, July is a big time for people not to be in church and you made an attempt to be at the house of God. You should be thankful for that. But here's the thing. It's easy to hold on conviction in here. Come on. It's so easy to tell people, I'm a follower of Christ. I have convictions on Sunday. No one was trying to, none of our greeters were trying to sell you drugs when you walked in. I mean, if they were, you need to let me know right now because we need to figure that out. Like, you're still welcome here, but we got to talk, right? Like, like, we weren't singing songs and lyrics that were objectifying women in nasty ways. We didn't have pornographic images in the lobby when you walked in. It's easy to have conviction here. There's no pressure. But on Wednesday, when you're in your house by yourself at night, and when Thursday comes and you're at your workplace and your coworker who is not your spouse begins to flirt with you, or maybe you're about ready to make a sleazy job decision, or maybe at the break room people are beginning to gossip about other people, 
Or maybe Friday night comes and you know that you can't just have one drink and every time you drink one, it turns into drunkenness and we know what scripture says about drunkenness and you wake up hungover again and you look and smell just like the thing you've consumed. I'm not saying this to bring you down. I'm saying this that God has a life that's way better than the things that we can consume in this world. So conviction is easy on Sunday. And for my case, as a pastor on Saturday, it's easy to consume screens and distractions and forget about my family and forget to sit still in God's word and pray. It all looks different. I'm just saying it's easy to have faith in here. How are you? Blessed and highly favored, brother. Why is your kid's nose bleeding? I backhand them in the car on the way in. <laughs> How's everything? Things are just great. Things are fantastic. They're amazing. You're crying at night in a fetal position. Why? Because conviction's hard sometimes. But just remember, when you go through testing, when you go through conviction, what we are saying is, I'm not going to consume what this world consumes. This week, there's going to be opportunities for us to consume things that are going to destroy our spiritual state. And God has a plan for us that is so much better than what this world has. And he says, I know it will be tough. I know that there'll be peer pressure. I know there'll be moments, and I know, listen, that you'll even be tripped up. I know you'll fall into it, and I know you'll feel guilty, but God's grace is for you even when you fall into it. If you are here and you've been tripped up in those things, I'm not telling you your life is over. I'm telling you that Jesus paid a high price for it, and so get back up, but don't keep running back to it. Why? Because when we have conviction, we will be tested, but here's a good thing about testing. It will make you stronger. Check out the end of the story. Daniel 1, 15 through 16. It says, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. Check this out. <laughs> so after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of food and wine provided for the others. I'd be like, thanks, Daniel. Did you notice this? Because of his conviction, his soul was stronger. His body was stronger. His mind was sharper. And they noticed it. And the attendant noticed it so much, he said, hey, everybody, change your diet. Change your plans. We're going to change this thing up. Y'all, the people of God have a different diet than the world and culture. And he had conviction. And because he had conviction, it changed the culture and what he was at. It wasn't shouting. It wasn't picketing. It wasn't screaming. It was conviction. And when he was tested, he pushed through it. And when God was glorified, he goes, we're changing all the diets now. Why? Because something is different. Oh, what kind of church could we be? Or what kind of people could we be? That when people begin to see that our souls are at peace. That we have joy in the workplace when people are losing their mind. That our minds are sharper. That in the midst of trial, we're praising God. That they would see our convictions. They would see us healthier. They would see us stronger. They would see us with more wisdom. They would see us with patience and kindness. Our families are being blessed. And there's things happening in our life. Oh, how a place it would be when we would realize that our convictions could convince the world that what we believe is actually true. That's why I tell people all the time when you come in and worship, most of the time when people come in here, they could care less about the word sometimes preached that don't believe in God. But when they see a bunch of people worshiping a God in spite of their failures and brokenness, they say, that's something I want to be a part of. Why? Because they believe what they confess. Daniel did that. And when people look in and say, what makes you different? I can say, I just don't consume what the world consumes. I'm not perfect at it. I still got hangups, but I'm choosing to consume more of God things than the world things. I'm not waking up in the morning and consuming Fox News and CNN News, and so I don't live in fear. I'm not, I'm not waking up in the morning and scrolling through and feeding on my news feed on social media, looking at all these images that are fake and growing depressed because everyone's life looks better than mine. I'm not consuming that. I'm not consuming the images and all the lyrics that are exposing and degrading and 
tearing people down. Now listen, obviously I can't tell you if it's a sin or not sin to listen to music and watch movies. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying I am so amazed by people who say they are devoted to God, but they continue to devour the culture. You have to wrestle with it. I hope that we wrestle every time we watch something in a movie theater. I hope there's a wrestle in you. I hope you're asking yourself, should I be watching this? And that's not a bad thing. That means that there's a conviction in you. Not a guilty thing, but I hope we wrestle with it because it's when we grow numb that we might be in trouble. I hope we wrestle with it. Why? Because God has a better plan for our life. I'm not consuming these things, but instead, what am I doing? I'm consuming the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm consuming the images and thoughts that are laid out in this book I'm consuming the lyrics of the psalmist and the psalms that says God is for me even when the world is against me. And when I go through hurt and depression and despair, I know he will rescue me. I know he will be with me. And I know when the world gets dark, pain may end in the night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm going to consume the things of God. Why? Because my soul depends on it. And when we hold fast to conviction, People will see it and God will be glorified. This isn't about us. This is about him. So here's my prayer right now. Whatever God is leading you, wherever he's leading you, whatever you're consuming, bring it before God and ask, Lord, help me, Holy Spirit, with the conviction. I don't want to grow numb to your presence. When you're in a situation, you know the Spirit is doing something in your heart. Walk away. Find something to consume that is godly, that is uplifting, that is good. And I promise you, people will notice and we'll see more people turn their hearts to God. This is how we stand firm in the spirit of Babylon in 2023. We hold fast to conviction. We persevere during suffering and trial and we consume everything God has for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this word. Help me be a pastor of conviction to lead a church who has conviction. I pray right now for anyone who feels maybe guilty. That's not this message. I pray for grace to surround them right now. I pray, Father God, as they wrestle with you in this message, I pray, Lord, that they would be revealed. Father God, things would be revealed to them. If there's things that they are consuming, I pray that there would be an action plan. Not that they're going to be perfect, but they're going to put the right people around them. They're going to put themselves in right places, and they're going to start consuming the things of you. I pray for conviction, Father God, in a world of consumption where we want more of you. Lord, we need more of you, and I'm so grateful for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before I hand this over, I want everyone to look at me real quick. Every week in our church, we give someone the opportunity to follow Jesus. Like, Sean, what does that mean? It means that all of us are sinners, and our sin separates us from God, but Jesus died for us because he loved us so much, and if you want to be like the nation of God, like we see these Hebrew boys, it says that we have to put our faith in Jesus. What does that mean? It means that we are persuaded and believe that we may be sinners, but Jesus is a better Savior. And the moment he went on the cross, he paid for you and I's sin, and he paid that debt in full. And if we put our faith in him, we are brought in relationship with God, not by our works, but what Jesus did on the cross. It's a statement of faith. And so we're going to pray that prayer of faith right now. If you're here and would like to pray that prayer of faith, this is your moment to be a part of the people of God, to follow Jesus. A clean slate, a new person. He doesn't hold your sin against you anymore. He sees his son. So if you'd like to join us in this prayer, you can repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I sinned. You died for it, and you paid for it, and I believe it. I believe you died, and I believe you rose again. And today, I'm choosing to follow you. Take my hangups and my mistakes and use them for your good. In Jesus' name, amen. Just like that, you made a decision to be the people of God. And if you did that, I don't want you to leave without being celebrated. So I'm going to ask you to do something so bold. And at the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand, and here's why. We're just going to clap and cheer for you. That's what we want to do. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to celebrate you, and one of our ushers is going to give you a gift and a Bible that's going to help you with your walk with Christ. So if that was you, at the count of three, just boldly lift up your hand. Don't worry about the people next to you. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. 
three, if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you made a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to throw that hand up as high as possible so we can celebrate you. If you're watching online, there's a link that says, I decided to follow Jesus. Click that link, fill out the form, and we'll get you a gift as well. Well, praise God. We never want to leave without that opportunity, y'all. It's so good to be back. I love being at Authentic Church. I love you guys so much. Let's thank God for his word today.